Well, again, we're grateful that in God's good providence that we're able to be together in the midst of this week and to study God's word together. We're thankful for the good message we just heard on the love of Jesus that Jonathan's brought us and the great sacrifice made by him and the willingness and love that was there caused him so to do that we might have forgiveness of sins and hope of eternal life. We turn back to Second John, the second letter of John, and we now look at what we read actually last week, and we'll continue on with that. I want to begin, and as I said last week, we read this, but I want to start here and hopefully bring us our minds back to where we were when we finished last week. I'll begin in verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. The American Standard Version, 1901, renders it this way. Look to yourselves that ye lose not the things which we have wrought, but that ye receive a full reward. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the teaching, the same hath both the Father and the Son. If anyone cometh unto you and bringeth not this teaching, receive him not into your house and give him no greeting. For he that giveth him greeting partaketh in his evil works. There are obligations placed upon Christians, obligations that they must discharge if they are to be faithful children of God. And of course, only by being faithful to God as a Christian can one have the expectation of heaven at the end of time and the day of judgment. So a part of that being faithful is to be able to recognize truth from error and those who teach the truth over and against those who teach error. Now you'll notice that the King James says, whosoever transgression and yet the American standard said whosoever goeth onward it's interesting that the Greek word here actually means progressing so people who transgress who violate God's will are actually engaged in progressing beyond the authority of Jesus Christ. Now remember Colossians chapter 3 in verse 17 tells every Christian, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So our whole conduct is based upon our submission to the authority of he who is the king of kings and Lord of Lord. He declared that he had all authority, Matthew 28, 18. And thus that authority is set out in his last will and testament. He's no longer walking this earth where he can say how he wants to do this, that, or the other. The only way I can know what Christ is pleased with and what he's opposed to is by his will, his last will and testament. And that is the New Covenant or New Testament of the Bible. Thus, these letters, most of them, as we've said most often, making up the New Testament, most of them were written to members of the church. They were concerned, that is, the writers. God, of course, wrote the Bible by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the human hands that wrote it down, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But God wanted those who obey the gospel, who became Christian, his children, 
remain faithful to him in his family, which is the church. You can see that in 1 Timothy 3.15, where Paul says to Timothy that if he tarried long, that he would know how to behave himself. That is Timothy. In the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So it's obvious then that Paul, in writing that letter, wrote to a member of the church. We know, of course, Timothy was a preacher of the gospel. He's still concerned about him being faithful, even as he's strong enough and knowledgeable enough to preach the gospel. Thus, he says, he needs to conduct himself in a certain way that he might be what he ought to be in the church. Well, we need the same thing. And one of those things is to be able to know the Bible well enough to recognize false teachers. And he doesn't uh, spin his wheels here. He said, you have an obligation not to lose what you've invested in Christ, in verse 8. And so anybody... Anywhere, anytime, it's what the force of whosoever is that goes onward, that progresses beyond the authority of Christ as set out in his last will and testament, the New Testament. Anybody that transgresses that or goes onward and doesn't stay with, does not abide in the doctrine, American Sanders is teaching, because that's what doctrine means, tells uh, him that you won't have God if you progress beyond that doctrine. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, the teaching of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now, remember when Jesus was on this earth, and this is a passage we're all familiar with, he said, as John himself recorded in John chapter 14, verse 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, the only way to understand that would be in the light of abiding in the teaching of Christ, the doctrine of Christ. And since he's writing to members of the church, they've already heard the gospel, and from the heart they've believed and obeyed it. They've been baptized into Christ for the remission of their past sins. Now what? Well, they remain faithful. That involves testing people as to what they believe in the light of the truth of the Bible. So if you don't stay with it, abide in. If you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have the Father. Christ came so that through him we could be reconciled to the Father. And that happens when people believe and obey the gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16. And that obedience takes place to for the repentant believer when that person is immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of past sin. So once that happens, we now have the obligation to keep ourselves in the love of God, to keep ourselves within the boundaries of the authority of Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. He's our sovereign, our king. His word is law. So then he says, and this gets hard with some people, primarily because of friendships, family relationships, and emotional attachments. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, then what are we to do? Receive him not into your house, neither bidding God speed. Thus, we can't show any kind of encouragement to a false teacher. Now watch it. In his false teaching. Even in bidding him God speak. You'll notice that the American Standard said it this way. And give him no greeting. That makes it even clearer as to what is involved here and the message there is for us to receive and apply and are dealing with those who teach contrary to the teaching of Christ. So we're not to bid him even a greeting. That means that whenever we see somebody who is a noted false teacher, I'm not talking about someone who's just famous or well-known, 
but some we know that has embraced whatever false doctrine it is and they're busy about living it and teaching it or one or the other, then we're not to even greet them in such a way as to cause them to think that we support them in any way whatsoever. And that's very important to understand. Now, somebody might say, well, I just can't only do that. Well, then you can't do what God told you to do. And God has never made that so. What you're really saying is, I know what it said, but I'm unwilling to do what it said. Now, what's the difference in that in a member of the church and a person outside of Christ who says, I know what Acts 2 verse 38 says. It says to the believer, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I'm not going to do it. So that doesn't help anybody at all. All it does is show our disdain for Christ and for his teaching. I don't know how anyone could understand the good message that Jonathan brought a little while ago concerning the love of Christ and the sacrificial action that he took and how far he went in suffering and giving his life a ransom for us and take that view, especially one who's obeyed the gospel and understood what they were doing when they obeyed it. And yet here it comes, the same Christ who loved us and died for us, who has all authority, now, he's teaching us that which is good for our souls and getting us to heaven as Christians, and yet we want to abide by it. And yet I've seen that kind of thing go on all my life. But it's not going to work. But what won't get past the day of judgment, we better get rid of. And since Jesus himself said, as John, by inspiration, recorded it in John chapter 12, verse 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. So if what we're believing and what we're practicing or what we're leaving undone will not get us past the judgment day when we know what the judgment standard is that Christ will use, we have it in our hands right now. When we know such passages as this, what good does it do to pretend? And that's what we're doing. There's uh, nothing in the Bible that hurts us. Everything the Bible teaches is designed to get us from earth to heaven. And we need to understand that. So if we have a problem with things like this, then that just means there's no fault with God or Christ or the Bible or our brethren. Our our weakness is ourselves and our lack of faith in God through Christ and his word, as we just read it, to practice it. So the Christian who's faithful to Christ is not going to encourage a false teacher. For he that bid him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So what do I have to do to partake of the evil deeds of false teacher. Just encourage him in it. That's a sad situation. That people who wear the name Christian. Who have actually believed and from the heart obeyed the gospel. And then they bid God speed or give greeting in such a way to a false teacher. That it encourages him in his efforts to preach contrary to the gospel of Christ. Now with that in mind. I want us to turn back to Galatians uh, chapter 1. Because therein the Apostle Paul is dealing with these same things. The problem, of course, that Paul is dealing with in this letter to the Galatian churches was the Judaizing teacher, a Jew who is a Christian, but was teaching that Gentiles can only be saved if they are circumcised and keep the law. That was binding a law on them that God did not bind. The New Testament teaches no such thing. Now, he wasn't surprised that they were departing from the truth per se. What he was surprised about was they were doing it so quickly after having become Christians. Let's look in Galatians 1. And you'll notice that he prefaces in the first few verses of Galatians 1 
what he's about to say to them, which is which is quite scathing, really, by reminding them of just what Jonathan did in his message tonight, of just all of the love and sacrifice and suffering that Christ did to save them. Notice verse 4. Speaking of Christ who gave himself for our sin, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now watch it. I marvel that ye are so soon removed. Now the American standard says removing, meaning they were in the process of removing themselves from faithfulness to God. And they were doing it when he says, from him that called you into the grace of God, or Christ, unto another gospel. Well, in the Greek, you can say another, meaning another of the same kind. And you can say another, meaning another of a different kind. You can't do that in English. You have to give explanations like I'm giving here in order to me, uh, to get the message across, that to the Greek person who spoke Greek in those days and wrote it, they say it immediately, because in the Greek, he says, what he's actually saying is from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto a gospel of a different kind. A different kind from what? From the one Paul originally preached to. And that's why we see here, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. False doctrine always troubles people. It's a message from Satan. Satan is the author of every error and of every lie. He's the father of lies. False doctrine is a lie. It's a lie because it's contrary to the truth. Paul sees this. And he said these folks would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have preached unto you, let it be accursed. That's how in English right here we can see that he's talking about them having heard and believed something that was different from what he preached to. So there's a gospel of the same kind, and there's a gospel of a different kind. They had heard the gospel that Paul had preached. That's how they became Christian. But now somebody's come along preaching a gospel of a different kind. And he makes it very clear that one won't save you. And he makes it clear also that even if you receive something directly from an angel and it contradicts what you've heard from me as an apostle of Christ, then you should turn away from it. He said, let that person be accursed. American standard is anathema. It means in Greek, cut off. Now think about that for me. To be cut off from God is to have no hope and without God in the world. And so Paul is saying to these Christians of the churches of Galatia, and it ties in so well with 2 John 8, 9, 10, 11, that if a person brings a false doctrine to you, in this case, a gospel different from one Paul originally preached to them that made them Christian, then let him be cut off. Let him be cut completely off from God. Now, what's interesting, too, is that Paul, no doubt, is making a play on words because the Judaizing teacher who saying you Gentiles can be saved by believing in Christ, repenting of your sin, confessing your faith in him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. And that the men must be circumcised to keep the law. Well, that's not in the gospel of Christ. But that's what they were doing. That's the different kind of gospel. So he says, let him be accursed. Let him be cut off. In other words, when you think of circumcision, you think of being something being cut off. Paul saying if anything ought to be cut off, it ought to be these false teachers. As we said before, so say I now again. By the way, the Lord doesn't have to say anything at one time to make it binding on us. And he's repeating himself here. That ought to cause everybody to sit up and take notice. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received. Let him be a curse, let him be anathema, let him be cut off. So that's the seriousness of teaching a false doctrine. A doctrine contrary to and against the doctrine of the New Testament, the gospel system, 
and one believing and obeying. So that tells us something about how God looks and views, if you please, a false teacher. He should be completely cut off from God. And he tells the brethren here in 2 John, don't have anything to do with them. No thing whatsoever that would encourage them in teaching their false doctrine. Don't even bid them greedy if they're going to take that as something that encourages them to keep on doing what they're doing. Well, it's right the opposite. You take Galatians 1, and you'll see they should be separated. They should be cut off. So that lets us know a little bit more about what's involved in the meaning of verses 9, 10, and 11 of 2 John. Now, he brings his the second epistle to a close. When he says, having many things to write unto you, well, my human curiosity would like to know what those would have been. But the Bible's sufficient and not itself declare everything one needs to know and to do in order to be faithful to God, so we don't need it. He said, I'm not going to write this with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that uh, your joy may be full. And remember, he wrote first epistle saying, I want your joy to be full. I want you to have the same fellowship with God and Christ the apostles have. And so he says, I want to continue our visit only face to face. And I want you to have your joy as full as it's possible to be. So then he says, the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Well, we don't know who that sister was. It's the sister of the elect lady we don't know who she was but we we don't even know for sure whether she was a christian but we know these children evidently the children of thy elect sister we see uh, so he knows them this is not something that uh, some people that he may know all obvious that he knows them and then he says amen which is simply meaning so be it it is a wonderful thing to be able to know that brethren are living like the book teaches. He begins with this letter with that when he says plainly in verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. All the time, that's not the case. Over the years, they've been many now with me, uh, we've known people that while we were working with that particular church, at least they appeared to be very sound, involved in all the works of the church, uh, maybe even leaders in the church. And yet sometime later, find out after we left there, as we're talking and asking about people, that they're not even faithful anymore. I remember one time when I was preaching one congregation, there were several congregations in town, uh, elderly member of the church moved back to that city and she did not go to the church where she had her membership when she had lived there in former time but she came where we were at that time and in the process of things we had heard about her and we had known that she'd been very active very faithful in the church as far as human knowledge didn't know anything had taught classes, and then all of a sudden, she doesn't show up at all. One of the elders and myself went to visit her, and we found her in the yard working in her flowers. And we told her we had missed her. We didn't understand what her situation was. Was there anything we could do to help, or was there problems? She said, no. I've just grown away from having to be there all the time, and I, I just haven't seen the need to be there. Well, something sure happened with her from that point back however many years before it had been when she was not only attending all the time at the church where she was a member, but was teaching and regularly supporting and involved. So there's always a danger for people to cease to be faithful. And there's not a few preachers that have done the same thing. So there's never going to be anyone no matter how much Bible you know and how well you live it, that doesn't need to give honest, objective examination of their lives. 
And thus Paul states with the Corinthians, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Well, that doesn't just apply to a few people. It applies to everybody that's been to the church. And here is some direction in Second John to encourage us in doing that and the attitude that ought to exist always among brethren toward false teachers. Now, let me make this clear before we leave the book. We hear so much about loving people. And John said a whole lot about it. And it's so true when it's proper love. Do we really understand the love that Christians are to have for God, for the truth, for their neighbor, and for one another? Rest assured that whatever that love is, it never sets aside obedience to the truth. It never sets aside having to teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It never permits a person to support anybody, whether in the church or out, who is advocating error. God makes that very clear here. There is an interesting comment made, and we'll look to that before we move on to 3 John. In the great chapter on love that Paul wrote, he makes an interesting observation. In other words, we learn something about just what love is. There he, of course, King James refers to it as charity. Uh, today we've come to understand that charity primarily reflects love being practiced. And of course, love is not good for anything to not practice. But notice what he says in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, I mean, verse 6. Chapter 13, 1 Corinthians, verse 6. He says concerning the qualities or the attributes of agape love, which is the love that's the highest form of love, it always seeks another person's good, as the Bible defines what is good. And notice what he says in verse 6. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices not in iniquity, error, evil, wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. So whatever this love is, it does not countenance error. It does not support those who teach and live it. And it cannot have fellowship with those who do. Now that makes good sense in harmonizing the agape love with what John's saying here. And that is, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, neither receive him into your house and bid him God's speed. For he that bid him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So you don't have to just teach a false doctrine just support somebody who does. And you're just as much a part of the program to lead somebody off into error as the person who actually teaches the doctrine. Well, we'll leave that now and we will look on over to the third epistle. I would um, I would point out to you that you can, this. in fact, it naturally divides itself in this way. It divides itself by talking about or referring to three particular people by name. You'll notice, first of all, in the first verse, the elder and the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Gaius was a, was a name that was quite common among the Romans. And this one is the well-beloved. He's addressing him as a brother in Christ, obviously faithful. He identifies himself as he did in the second epistle, the elder, O Presbyteron. Uh, again, I think we have to conclude that that is a term of endearment as an older person. And John certainly was chronologically at this time. And he says, uh, Beloved, speaking of Gaius, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in hell, even as thy soul prosper. I don't know how we can say that about a lot of people nowadays. We might say, I wish your soul was prospering as well as your physical well-being is prospering. But that wasn't the way that John looked at it. 
And so he tells us that I want Gaius to prosper and uh, hell, even as he is prospering in spiritual matters. So that lets us know further how strong Gaius is in his faithful service to God. Notice he follows the same pattern as he did in addressing the elect lady in the second epistle. He says, I, uh, for I rejoice greatly. When the brethren came and testified of the proof that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. He used, looking at the latter part of that in verse 3, he uses the idea of walking in the truth here as he did in the second epistle. Walking in something means a continuation in it, abiding in it, being a part of it, it a part of you, living it out in our daily lives. Uh, Jonathan referenced 1 Corinthians 15, 58, which we often do when he was speaking a little while ago. And that's really saying the same thing as walking in the truth, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's what Gaius was doing. And that's how he was demonstrating to all his faith in Christ. It sort of ties in with James 2, where he talks about a living faith, which is an obedient faith, in contradistinction to a dead faith, which is a faith that does not obey. Faith that has works, if not works, is dead, being alone. So it's not just a mental understanding of something, that it's the truth, it's the application of that truth in living as that truth directs us. Now, John says, the brethren have testified the fact you're faithful. This brings this up, I think, rather interesting. This says that brethren were able to speak to an apostle about another brother's faithful conduct and what that implied about that person. Sometimes we hear people saying, well, I don't want people talking about me. Well, if they're giving testimony, if they're offering facts in the case, then that's just the way it is. Facts are just facts. They don't change according to somebody's perspective. And so when you give testimony, that's what you're looking for. Here are brethren who gave a factual account of the kind of life Gaius was living, and he was walking in the truth. And then he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. In other words, I have no greater joy than to know that my children, meaning those he may have had a first-hand effort in converting, at least he was directly responsible in some way for their being children of God. And what he's saying is, that I'm glad to hear they're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what he's rejoicing over. We ought to train our own minds to be able to rejoice over people who love the Lord and keep his commandments, because that's what it amounts to. So he says that, and then still addressing Gaius, he says, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and the stranger. Well, that's interesting. He's just got through saying the brethren have testified of the fact that you're living faithful to God. And I'm very happy and I rejoice greatly that that's the case with you because I certainly am glad to hear that those I've had a part in converting are still faithful. Remember, Paul marveled that those brethren in the church of Galatia were so soon leaving the truth. Um, they hadn't been members of the church long, and that surprised them that allow false doctrine to enter in so quickly. So here, he wants him to remain faithful. So he says, whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and the strangers, do it faithfully. Well, that's just another way of saying doing it as authorizes in his word for you to do it. He could have very well quoted Colossians 3.17 right here, because that's what John's concerned about. And that's the concern that every one of us should have. It's awful easy to carry out our daily lives and just forget about how the brethren are living. 
This says I have an obligation to know how my brethren are living, and they have an obligation to know how I'm living. From the standpoint of are we faithful to the Lord in all that we do? We can see that taught very plainly when our Lord himself, by the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle John, has the um, letters uh, written to the seven churches of Asia. That shows you that the Lord was involved in every one of those churches concerning every member of those churches as to the kind of life they were living. Were they faithful? Were they not? And you see that in those churches, some were faithful, some were not. And he tells them what to do that they might be as he expects them to be, and they ought to be, and they must be if heaven is to be their home, if they're to be faithful to the Lord, in other words. Because he would say in Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, and thou shalt receive the crown of life. John's concerned about that here as he writes the guidance. Now, notice what he says, because the sentence didn't end with verse 5. Below, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which, and notice again, have borne witness of thy charity. He cites brethren talking. He's brethren been talking about Gaius. And they've been talking about Gaius to John. And they've been giving the facts in the case about Gaius as to whether he's faithful to the Lord or whether he's not. Now, this authorizes every member of the church, and especially elders of the church, in view of their work as shepherds of the flock, watching after the soul, to know how brethren are living, to know whether they're faithful or not, and to be able to research their lives to know whether they're faithful or not. This was going on right here, and John in the letter makes it clear he doesn't cover it up. He's very, as we say nowadays, transparent. He wants guys to know. People have testified, brethren have testified to the fact, they've given facts in the case, that you are faithful to God. I want you to remain that way. They borne witness of thy love, thy charity, before the church. They, you demonstrated your love for the brethren. You demonstrated your love for the work of the church. They have given testimony to that to me. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Well, this was a time when people traveled. The fastest form they had was if they were to take a ship to go somewhere. And that wouldn't even compare as far as uh, how fast you could get there on a ship today. But any other way they had of traveling was walking for the most part or riding a beast of burden. And I said, well, they had horses, but horses were considered instruments of war. They didn't just ride them for pleasure as people do today. And if they rode anything, it was a donkey or in some sort of cart or ox cart, or they simply walked. So brethren didn't have places to stay all the time available to them. And that's one reason we're taught that Christians and a part of their faithfulness are to demonstrate hospitality. So he brought that up when it came to Second John to the elect lady. And that's what he has in mind when he writes uh, verses 9 through 11. She would be disposed to offer hospitality. John says you can't do that to a false teacher. You're supporting a false teacher when you offer them hospitality. Uh, you're going to um, be participating in the very false doctrine they're teaching, whether you believe it or not. Well, he's saying here, you're supporting the church, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, over and against one like he addressed to these who taught false doctrine, and transgressed and went beyond the gospel of Christ, but these who are godly, then you continue to support them. You continue to show them hospitality. You continue to help them as you've been doing. Because, verse 7, that for his name's sake, they went forward, taking nothing of the Gentiles. So here, these are brethren, and they're living faithful lives. They're traveling. You're known, and the brethren have testified to that fact to me that you've supported the brethren in this way. I want you to continue to do it. There's one caveat. Make sure they're faithful. Make sure they're true to the doctrine of Christ. And continue to do this. Notice, because that for his name's sake, that's the Lord. They went forth. 
they're doing the work of the church. They're spreading the gospel. They're out on business of their king, the Lord Jesus. And they don't take anything they're from the they don't take anything from the Gentiles. That was a way of saying they're dependent upon the church. They're dependent upon those who have the same faith and the same interest and the same love and the same work as they have. And they don't want to burden the Gentiles. You know, Paul did that when it came to preaching the gospel. He said, I had a right to take the money of you brethren, but I didn't want anybody to say I was just doing this for money, so I elected not to do so. And that shows us that at times that we have a right to forego what the Bible authorizes us to do if it's expedient or advantageous that we do so. And this is what we have going on here. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Well, over in second epistle, he warns about bidding false teachers God speed. Well, if we do, we're partakers of them, evil deed they do. Now he turns around and says, but it's right. To Gaius, he says this, and so to all of us. It's right to support those who are on the Lord's work, who are in the Lord's work, who are preaching the gospel. We must be concerned about that. Do you realize what this is saying about the biblical doctrine of cooperation between churches and between Christians in getting out the gospel? That's what he's saying. Cooperate with those who are acting under the authority of Christ and are faithful in the discharging of their duties. Well, we're coming down to the end of the time we have allotted in our class. And uh, we'll pick this up and the Lord willing next week, finish out the third epistle of John and then see what we can do to move forward. But before we leave tonight, let's do as our custom is and uh, go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Would you bow with me? Our divine and most holy Father, we come before thy throne, the hallow of thy name, to thank thee for this time together, to thank thee for thy word, to thank thee for the ability to understand it and to know that this is the way that thou dost communicate with us. Thou dost lead and guide and direct us. Help us, Father, to know that in providential matters thou art with us. And help us to be sure that we're abiding in the doctrine of Christ and that we will help brethren who are faithful to the doctrine of Christ, but that we will not help those who teach another doctrine, who teach another gospel, who teach the lies of Satan, whatever it may be. Help us to be honest. Help us to love thee and to love the brethren. Help us to be mindful of those who are lost in sin. May we prepare ourselves and put it into practice with those things that help us reach the lost, that they might know the saving blessing of the gospel. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.